Just for the record, I no longer hold the cross-country cannonball record. Uh, it was broken, and we'll get to that at the end, but it doesn't matter. My name is Alex Roy, and I'm here to talk about the extinction of human driving. I'm best known for having once set the cross-country cannonball record with my co-pilot, David Maher. Uh, in 2006, after 24 years, we successfully crossed the country, driving from New York to LA at an average speed of 90.4 miles an hour. This is something no one had done in decades, which was extraordinarily dangerous and extraordinarily expensive. It required thousands of hours of planning for every hour we spent in the car, for a total of 31 hours. This is a picture depicting the interior of the car we took across country. This was a BMW M5. The car was equipped, you can see it, with two displays for the night missions camera system, an air-to-ground radio, for which communicated with a plane looking for police with radio at the police locations. <laughs> we had great light kill switches, all running light kill switches. The night vision system would allow us to drive with no headlights. Not that we did that, because that's very illegal. And to see potholes, animals, and police cars idling in the center median. We had a fuel cell. We had a police scanner, CB radio, radars, radars, everything you could put in a car. We were the best prepared people who had ever done this, following in the footsteps of some very, very famous people, Brock Gates, Dan Gurney, and others. And when I look back at the video of what I did, Dave Mark, 10 years ago, today, I look at that and I'm older, wiser, not nearly as stupid and reckless, and I think to myself, how much safer I and everyone else would have been if I hadn't been driving? And then I thought to myself, how much faster I could cross the country in the future if no one else was driving. So when Tom was driving, <laughs> someone in my shoes, of course, that's what they're going to pay. How to take advantage of improvements in technology to serve myself? <laughs> is not technology meant to solve problems? Of course it is. So I was asked to begin writing about autonomous cars because I had a peculiar perspective. And it seemed very obvious to me that autonomous driving is a good thing. There is a social benefit. If we could reduce pollution, well, don't ask me that, but if you could reduce pollution in general across all cars, that's good. If you can make driving safer, whether or not you're actually in the autonomous car, that's good. And if you can reduce traffic, well, I guess that's good. So, in my research, I came across an article by Matt Holman at BuzzFeed just a few days ago as I was preparing this presentation. He's the Silicon Valley editor. And he got a ride in a Google car. And in this car, he stated that he had seen the future. His life was transformed. A car with no steering wheel. And he laid out all the arguments, arguments that paralleled mine as for why Thomas Driver was a good thing. And then he got to, I guess, the really the hinge of it all. And the hinge for him is that driving should be made illegal, be social engineered out of existence, and that anyone, and I quote, Car lovers should go fuck a tailpipe. You can imagine how this struck me. <laughs> so, oh, have a sequence. A picture of how dangerous it was to drive across country. So I went back to the beginning and I started thinking to myself, set aside my own motivations to try to get across country faster and think about what actually is on this driving does, what it will do, how what it means. What is a car? Why do we drive? The car for me, of course, is identity. This is a picture of my father with his first car um, in the 50s. He was a survivor of the war. He, in fact, escaped from Brussels in May 1940 that the Nazis were arriving. The family couldn't find a way out of the city. He and his father and brother broke into the local Citroën dealership and stole a car. The last car remaining, a crank start vehicle. His brother got it started. They got in and made it to France. He eventually made it to America, joined the army, went back, fought in World War II, and fell in love with the European car, started a company selling, importing sports cars to America, Porsches like this one. This is a picture of my mother with my father's car right after they were married. It is not a great leap to suggest she might not have been attracted to such a man because she, of course, was in love with James Dean, who died in a Porsche Speedster. This is a picture of me being brought home from the hospital that I've never seen. So you can imagine my identity is tied up very much in cars. 
Which brings us to Rendezvous, a film my father will not let me watch as a child, and I up only after he died. Rendezvous is a film made in the 70s. Claude Lelouch, a French film director, took a camera, John was stabilized, put it in the front of a car, and drive, drove across Paris in nine minutes. It is an automotive snuff film on wheels. He runs every red light, almost kills six people. The entire time, you can't believe it's true. And he gets to the north end of the city, to Montmartre. And there, he pulls up in front of the steps of the church. And the reason he's done this, because we know nothing to justify it, a beautiful woman runs up the steps and hugs and kisses the driver. His face is on scene. We don't even know if it's him. And suddenly, all the danger, all the madness is completely justified. It, it, we can, it's wiped away because of the hands of love, even though he could have killed six people. It makes no sense. And it makes perfect sense to someone like me and to anyone who's seen it. To this day, it has a strange and compelling power. Which, of course, leads to me and the cannibal. <laughs> and all the madness at NEC I ever did in the car, safely. After seeing Rendezvous, after seeing the Cannonball Run films, after learning that my father wanted to do the Cannonball and didn't because my mother threatened to leave because of the two young sons, I decided to make driving my life's work. So, why drive? If you ask anyone why they drive fast, you get a mountain of answers, rationalizations. Oh, uh, you know, it's cool, because you feel better, it's interesting, it's fair. All these answers or rationalizations are tied up in a root level I question my identity. Because when I lie awake at night, 10 years after setting the record, and I try to explain to myself, I, to impress my dead father, to, to uh, you know, freedom. Uh, but the reality is, and I hope there's no kids in the audience, the reality is, and it, I think it's true for every single person who's ever driven too fast and irresponsibly, for me, the reality is, I want to express the volcanic man magma alpha power mankato that lies with me. I want everyone to know I am the best, even if only for one second I made that pass illegally. It was dangerous, stupid. I did it. I'm better than you. <laughs> <laughs> totally irrational. And yet, if anyone's ever got a speeding ticket, even if you pled not guilty, you know you deserve it. Will Wright, who was the creator of the game Sims and Sim City, which I'm quite sure many of you have played, unbeknownst to most people, in 1980, when he was young, he owned the Ferrari 308. No one would think of Will Wright as a car guy. He's a genius and intellectual, not a car guy. He is more car guy than almost anyone you've ever seen in a flashy sports car. Will Wright was the winner of the US Express, which was the secret, illegal, underground successor race to the Cannonball Run. And Will Wright speaks more lucidly about what a car is than anyone I've ever heard speak on the topic. He says that he's always been mesmerized by the ability of the human mind to form an interface with a machine like a car. That no one who has a car accident ever says, my car had an accident. You say, I had an accident. Because the car has become, in fact, your body. And that is true. That is 100% true for people who say they don't like driving. It's true, because the car has become your body. Look at the forms of sports cars. The Porsche 911. This is a Bugatti. These are incredibly sexual forms. They're very organic forms. They're not just aerodynamic. There's a reason they look the way they do. They look, well, they look like sexual creatures. If you look at, well, this is me wearing a wig, that doesn't matter. This car, this is an GTS, a long front, a short rear overhang. Muscle cars, Mustangs, Camaros, Corvettes, long front, short rear overhang. Very sexual forms. Men, sports cars, if you look at them, they only come in two forms. They come in the form of a male or a male. And the other one is that of a woman who's just woken up on a bed, lying face down, about to get up. Sexual forms, expressions of our bodies, of who we are, of how we want to be seen. This, by the way, is my sister right now, Sam. This is an interesting car because it's the only car ever made that looks both like a man, his organ, and a woman lying down right there. <laughs> which leads us to Pebble Beach. Last month I was at Pebble Beach, which is a gathering of exotic cars and vintage cars at an auction. It's, it's a wonderful event. Everyone should go to learn something about human nature. 
at Pebble Beach, you will see every form of personality expressed via car. And what's interesting is that both these cars are going to be driven fast, have never been driven fast. These sports cars have been parked, brought by truck from home. If they are ever driven fast, they are driven from A to B by a truck. And maybe if they're driven, well, let's be messed that one up. If they're ever driven fast, they're driven fast from home to a restaurant. And then up and down the block and back home. Ten minutes. It's true. It's true. Why? Because cars as a form of expression are not necessarily even an exclusively expression of who we truly are, but they are of how we want to be seen. So think of the guy who pulls up in a Prius, perfectly fine, say a gas school, in a Prius. <laughs> and the same guy might show up in a Lamborghini when he gets out. It's, it's an event. <laughs> Channeled into a fairly harmless, 
no funnel, that of driving. Verse is being placed into a baby seat, as in the end of the movie Wall E. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Okay, listen, I'm a big fan of The Walking Dead, and the part I love the best is when the guy who has everything before the zombies arrive, he has a car that has everything, is as soon as the zombie holocaust starts, this guy's helpless. I love that part. The shot before it is delicious. I have a feeling no one in Vermont's going to suffer as much as people in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Think about it. You can fix your cars. <laughs> this is a normal autonomous car prototype as it exists today. Logically, and I actually support its propagation, this will flow out in the world in a few years, or some form of this made by them or someone else. This is Thanatos in action. James <laughs> Dean, representing everything that we want to be seen as. Sex, power, death. Portia has not suffered because James Dean died in Portia. On the contrary, part of the mythology of owning such a Portia, in fact, owning a Portia exactly like this of that generation, that James Dean had one. The straightest, most radical, right-wing Christian fundamentalist guy in this country. You know, no matter what he says, this is James Dean's oh, that's pretty good. <laughs> I asked recently a few people what they thought about um, getting into this to go to work. It makes perfect sense. As soon as they get over work, they want to get into this. Do you have to ask why? You don't. Because everybody wants to be James Dean, like, like Austin Powers, where they want to be loved by James Dean. Sex power death. What happens? when companies that have been selling us, marketing to us, cars for 115 years based on more horsepower, more, 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 power, traction, grip, horsepower, when they should just turn it off? That's never going to happen. Because driving is not about transportation, it's about transportation and transformation. And Thomas cars take away the transformation side. And let me end with this because I'm going to go way over time if I keep going. The day autonomous driving is mandated. If you've seen Mad Max for your own you're going to understand this. I'm going to go get in my car, grease on the head, and go cross country as fast as I can. I'm going to hire a hacker to mask my vehicle as an autonomous vehicle to get cross country so I can't be tracked. When I get there, I'm going to pretend the car was defective and I wasn't driving. I'm going to claim the record anyway. <laughs> And if you think in this country, even with the absolute men are defending, the defending the right to drive, that people are just going to give up their cars, you're wrong. You don't know my mother. Because my mother is still driving this. And she won't buy a gun, but she will tell you that if you grab the steel from her hands, they'll be cold and dead first. <laughs> so I'm all four times driving. I want to see most people safe. I want to see most people not driving. But I'll never stop. Thank you.